So let's talk about treatment of respiratory viruses. So it turns out that for influenza and RSV, we do have specific treatments that we'll talk about later, but for other respiratory viruses, we do not. And that includes viruses that cause the common cold. So that means when a patient comes to you with symptoms of the common cold, feeling bad, they're out of luck, there's no treatment. Now in this situation, some doctors might give antibiotics, like the famous z -Pac. But this is a really bad idea because antibiotics do nothing against viruses and they do actually have a lot of negative side effects. So for one thing, giving antibiotics inappropriately can increase antibiotic resistance. And that's true because anytime you expose bacteria to antibiotics, you increase the chance that they'll find a way to evade them. So you wanna limit your exposure as much as possible. Another thing that prescribing antibiotics can do is alter uh, people's microbiomes. So what is a microbiome? A microbiome is all the bacteria that live on or in your body but don't cause disease. And most notably, they are all over the GI tract. But these bacteria help you. They help you digest and they help defend you against other infections. So when you give antibiotics that can kill those healthy bacteria, that in itself can cause disease. And then finally, the third thing is that antibiotics, of course, are chemicals, and they can have their own toxicities that cause adverse effects anytime you give them to anybody. So you don't want to give antibiotics in these cases, and instead, in the majority of cases, what you end up doing is just giving supportive care, which means making sure that the patient is well hydrated and as comfortable as possible while their immune system fights off the virus. But since that's all we can really do, we think less about treatment with these viruses and we think more about prevention. And so how can we do that? Well, there's two main ways. Number one is to stop actual transmission of the viral particles. And number two, of course, is vaccines, which we have for some of these viruses. So let's start by talking about this first one. And the way that you stop transmission actually depends from virus to virus because there's actually two different ways that viruses can be transmitted. The first is through respiratory droplets. And the idea here is that viral particles actually sit in the secretions that we either cough or breathe out. And these droplets are usually kind of big so they can't travel that far through the air. Usually they can go about three to six feet. Now the second way that these viruses can be transmitted is through physical contact or on fomites. So when we say physical contact, we mean the viruses are sitting you know, on your hands so that when you touch someone, they can get onto that person. And fomites are physical objects like clothing, for example, that viruses can get onto and colonize and that way spread to another person when they touch the object. So based on this, for patients at home, we know that basically in kindergarten we were taught how to stop transmission. When you cough or sneeze, cover it up with a sleeve or a tissue and wash your hands so you don't run around spreading viruses from person to person. But when it comes to the hospital, we wanna be a little more precise because if we know a patient has a respiratory virus, we can take extra precautions to make sure that we don't spread that virus to another patient. And the precautions that we take depend on whether the virus transmits mostly by droplet or by contact. So if a patient has a virus that transmits mostly by droplet, then we put them on what we call droplet isolation. And this means that people going into the room should wear a mask over their mouth and nose. And that mask should actually also have an eye shield because otherwise the virus can spread through the mucous membranes of your eye. Now, on the other hand, for viruses that transmit mostly by contact, patients are put on contact isolation. And so that means they have to wear gloves and gowns to cover up their clothes. So some viruses like influenza only need droplet isolation. Some, like RSV, only need contact isolation. And then there are some, like adenovirus, that actually need both because they can really be transmitted by either method. But there's actually one more thing, which is that all patients, regardless of what 
virus they have. And actually, regardless of whether you even know they have a virus, all patients require standard precautions, which includes, most importantly, hand washing. Now, the other method of prevention we mentioned was vaccines. And we're going to talk about this in more detail later. But quickly, it turns out that most of these viruses that cause the common cold don't have any vaccines. And that sucks. For influenza, there actually is a vaccine. And all you need to know right now is that this is the best way, apart from hand washing, to prevent influenza. And everybody, with very rare exceptions, over the age of six months, should get the flu vaccine every year. Is it always a good match? No. Does it always stop the flu? No. Does it have adverse effects like causing autism? Absolutely not. So if someone asks you at a cocktail party, do you believe in the flu vaccine? As in, does it reduce morbidity and mortality from flu? The answer is absolutely yes. A couple thousand to tens of thousands of people die from the flu in the U.S. every year, and we want to get that number down. So there is a flu vaccine. Here's a needle to show that. And for RSV, there's not exactly a vaccine, but what you can do is give little kids very high dose of antibodies against RSV. So that's a way to kind of give them passive immunity. So if you want, you could call it a passive vaccine. Eventually, those antibodies will break down and won't be found in the blood anymore, and then the person won't have any immunity against RSV. 